a Tony Abbott came to government, leading to promise uh, leading Australia into a policy that would be more Jakarta than Geneva, in his words, in his national focus. He's been in office only a month, but he's been to Indonesia twice already, as has his foreign minister, George Fisher. And he's also gone on the record to state that Indonesia is Australia's most important foreign relationship, which uh, hasn't been made clear in those sorts of terms since Paul Keating, so unlikely bedfellows when it comes to Indonesia. He's clearly worked on his relationship with the Indonesian president, Sir Bambang Yono, and made it clear that he intends to solve issues, including domestic ones such as people trafficking and international bilateral issues like beef exports through bilateral dialogue and cooperation. Perhaps most tellingly, he's also pledged a lot of money, 15 million, to establish the Australian Centre for Indonesian Studies, which will also be based on us. This, he thinks, will be matched by 15 million from private sources and five from the university. And it's going to be aimed at building knowledge, building Australian knowledge about Indonesia, um, in a way to make Australians understand the nation and the he thinks, so the ability to function more effectively in it. As Abbott put it, strong relationships are based on mutual knowledge and understanding which is why this centre will make such an important contribution. So basically what this means, if he's putting in so much money and such a serious investment so early into the new term, it signals that this government thinks one of the major priorities in foreign policy terms is to make Australians think about Indonesia and come to know Indonesia a little bit more. And the reason why he sort of foregrounded this as such a big issue is that Australia and Indonesia apparently suffer from a chronic inability to understand each other. The relationship when it's discussed in policy circles, in, acade in academic circles, uh, in journalism, and really it's that every space. It's talked about as one in which misperceptions are found on both sides, which is understood to have a measurably negative impact on diplomatic relations. Now this idea isn't new. In 2010, the President of the Republic of Indonesia, Sula Bambagiono, came to Australia on a state visit. While well, he was here, he, he and Kevin Rudd, who was the Prime Minister at the time, discussed all the highest level issues of that day, terrorism, people smuggling, economic development, and foreign aid. But when it came to addressing Parliament, which you see here, you don't have focus on the way Australians and Indonesians perceive each other. He said that stereotypes about Indonesia held by Australians and those held about Australia by Indonesians were having a serious impact on bilateral relations. More than that, he said this was, and this is the quote, the most persistent problem in our relations. Yudhiyono went on. In particular, he said, he wanted Australians to be able to understand that Indonesia was, again, quote, more than a beach playground with coconut trees. Now, academic and policy research also highlight the importance of misperceptions on both sides. Those reports that are put up on the slide by the Lowy Institute, uh, by News Poll and others, are just a sort of tiny fraction of the amount of work that's done on perceptions in this space, which is really quite unusual. If you look at sort of other work on other international bilateral relations, cultural factors, foreign policy, doesn't really come into it very often. In the Indonesian relationship, perceptions, what we think, what ordinary people think, all of a sudden seems to have been bolted to some sort of primary place, which it doesn't tend to be. Obviously, this is important, as it points the importance to the role of the public and of popular and vernacular perceptions in the conduct of international relations. If we're going to take this seriously, that popular and vernacular ideas matter in international relations, then this also gives a bit of a call to arms for a new way of doing international history, which also brings these ideas of the public in. One of the major questions, obviously, in Australian history is that of Australia's relations with Asia. And this is what I've been Asia has long been a central component of Australian history, but for the first part of the century, it was a negative force, the place against which Australia defined itself. It was at the front of mind, obviously, when Australians began to think about who they were as a nation and what they stood for. And we know this because the first piece of legislation enacted a confederation in 1901 was, of course, the Immigration Restriction Act, which formed the bedrock of the white Australia policy, which was effectively uh, 
task in order to keep Asia out, to define Australia against the region. Clearly, Australian ideas about the region have undergone pretty dramatic shifts since this time. The reorientation of Australian society, economy, and politics towards greater integration and cooperation with the Asian Pacific has been one of the most dramatic changes of the past 50 years. And this is Mr. Straight from the time that seems to go so good. As historians, it's our job to explain historical change and so explaining how and why Australia's relations with Asia have made this dramatic jump from fear to engagement in such a, in relative terms, short amount of time is obviously a core question. Typically, historians approaching this question, looking at the problem of fear to engagement, have focused on diplomatic relationships. In that narrative, historical change takes place at the level of elite, politicians and diplomats. And the dominant model of diplomatic history, if you take the other reader, ascribes agency to a very small number of politicians and diplomats who are cast as visionaries, who sort of lead and drive um, relations between Australia and Asia. This approach, although it covers the basics, has been critiqued as being really quite simplistic and not taking account of the fact that not only do politicians exist in a broader culture and are influenced uh, by that culture themselves, but the very ideas that can possibly influence um, policy in democracies have to at some level according with popular perception. Scholars in America and scholars in uh, Europe in particular have picked out the idea that in international history it's really not enough to just be looking at these elites. That to get a full picture and to get a sort of satisfying account of change, which really explains change rather than just pointing to you know what happened but explains how it happened, we need to take account of the shifting contours of images, stereotypes and discourses in the public sphere. This is also the case in Australia, and again, this uh, space of Australian history about Asia is one in which the popular and vernacular um, perceptions have been taken quite seriously. Over more than 100 years, historians such as David Walker and Adrian Vickers, Lachlan Strong as well, have pointed out, Asia has been an object of interest, even of all nerve, for a great number of ordinary Australians. This meant that what governments could or couldn't do or even what they could or couldn't imagine themselves doing, um, was firmly delineated by uh, what was acceptable in the public space. So if it didn't fly with the people, it really was to have flown the policy. The natural attitude created the space in which governments could implement policy. They couldn't orchestrate the gradual shift from fear to engagement uh, if they didn't bring the public with them. Moreover, again, the idea is that politicians don't exist outside of culture. They're not these visionaries who sort of exist in an um, abstract space where they work out the national interest. What the national interest is is always an abstract and constructive question. So when it comes to Australia's relations with Indonesia, this sort of state of importance is one of the few spaces in which it's actually admitted that public perceptions, public attitudes count. And this gives us a space in which we can have a look at international history as one that also draws the public. Which is what I'm going to be doing today through the role of travel and tourism. So my key question, I suppose, as I approach this has been, how are political attitudes formed? How do ordinary people come to build the sort of bank of rumours that passes knowledge about foreign others? And what processes cause these images to change over time? Obviously, there's more than one answer. We know, ever since uh, it was Saeed wrote Orientalism all the way back in 1978, just how complex these issues are, how many different kinds of uh, things influence popular perceptions and ideas about other places, foreign people. The arts, policy, um, academic work, literature, all those through which these ideas and images are constructed. However, in the 20th century, there's definitely another element to it, and one that takes on increasing importance, I would argue, as um, globalisation moved on and as the 20th century became really one of high mobility, and that is, of course, personal contact. Rather than just reading about it or hearing about it, Australians have had access to first-hand interaction with Indonesians, not only through government policy, such as the Colombo Plan, or migration, or any official ties, 
as overwhelmingly through travel and tourism. So travel and tourism, I'll explain to in a second, so you don't, don't worry about that, I'll get into the small print. Travel and tourism might appear to be quite frivolous at first glance, but in fact they can be of profound importance in shaping how we think about foreign places and foreign people. Travel, in a sense, is politics in action, and so international travel can be a microcosm of international relations in the public space. Now, both sides of politics have recognised the political significance of tourism. In the 2003 Foreign Affairs White Paper, paper the Howard government argued that tourism is quite a, quite a positive force in developing and deepening Australia's relations with other countries. The 2012 Australian and Asian Century White Paper, Sarah Gillard, Labor, noted also <coughs> noted that improving people to people relations can unlock large economic and social gains. The Howard, Rudd, Gillard, and now Abbott governments have walked in step consistently stating that people-to-people -people links, including tourism, add depth and stability to our relationships with Asia, and they have all made uh, engagement and people-to-people ties a positive priority. So why is travel so important? Because it facilitates new ways of thinking that can have major repercussions on political attitudes. I want you to sort of engage with your own travel experiences just for a little bit while I just explain the theory behind it. The argument goes that travel produces new political subjectivity by taking you away from your home space, moving you to another country, you immediately start to think about the relationship between yourself and your own country, your politics, and the place to which you're travelling. In this context, the idea is that it encourages ordinary Australians to reflect about the world and their place in the world, not only on an individual level, but also on a national level in new ways. This is obviously bigger than just Australia and Indonesia and affects perceptions of Asia as a whole and the world as we discussed with the larger patterns that we're following. And not just since the boom in mass tourism from the 70s, but also all the way back from the colonial period, where surprisingly much of the scholarship is actually the strongest. The idea, if travel was significant in the 19th century, in the sort of first age of globalisation, how much more significant it is in the 20th century as globalization and hypermobility um, really took off is imperative to discover. The number of Australians traveling to Asia grew exponentially during the 20th century, and this is what we see here. So Asia is in blue, Europe is in red, so total Asia and total Europe. From a very low baseline, improvements in transport technology, particularly passenger aircraft, encourage more Australians to travel across the region. More Australians travelled to Asia for the first time in 1968, you can see that first crossing, and every year since 1980. And the numbers have become really, truly staggering. Um, some of you may know, Australians spend more per head on international travel than any other people in the world. This is the number one um, market for spend per head. In 2010, Australia made over 7 million overseas trips, so that's about just under one in three people. Roughly half of those, so approximately 3.5 million people travelled to Asia, or trips were made to Asia. This rate of contact, which means something like one in every five or six Australians visits the region every year, means that more people come to know something about Asia through personal contact than really any other source of information. Not only is it important because of the numbers, it's also important because of the experience of travel. So again, thinking about your own experiences, when people come back from travel, they tend to think that they really know something about the place that they went to. You've seen it for yourself, you're an eyewitness. You've you know, had personal contact. You come away pretty sure of your experiences. Scholarship on this sort of uh, confirms this. People really come away thinking that they know the real place that they visited to visit. And Australians coming back to talk about the real Asia in a way that they have real trouble, perhaps, if um, it hadn't been for the personal experience. Travellers trust their own experiences, and friends and neighbours trust the experiences of their sort of trusted um, friends. You come back, people listen to your travel stories, 
And so travel tales, even if they're not necessarily true or the best source of information, carry that sort of convincing element that um, other sports may not. So my book, which will be called Visiting the Neighbors of Australia and in Asia, and which is due out next year, looks at these patterns over the 20th century and 21st century in Asia as a whole. And so I come up with three conclusions, which all of which can sort of feed into the case study I'm looking at tonight. Firstly, moving between Australia and Asia led travelers to reflect on their relative proximity, which in turn demanded a reevaluation of the relationship between Australia and its region encouraging that most sort of common cliche, which is the discourse that we are so familiar with, is barely a question anymore, which is this idea of Asia and Australia as neighbours, and Indonesia in particular as the nearest neighbour. Secondly, being in Asia encourages Australians to take a new interest in the region, its cultures, people and politics, in a way that they possibly wouldn't have if they'd never been there. Uh, including sort of through personal contact and personal um, ideas. And thirdly, the increasing rate of travel normalised the region for Australia and normalised this idea of Asia, making it seem less foreign and less threatening. And so, in a way, allowing policies of engagement and national integration, however it's been um, put over the 20th century, to forming the public space in which those ideas can assume that those policies can occur. By the late 20th century, travelling to Asia had become a normal part of life for Australians. It's not revolutionary to say that. It's the very banality of that that makes it so important, though. Yet, it is a completely normal thing to do. We're completely comfortable going to Asia. And because it is so banal, we've often forgotten that, you know, even 40, 50, 60, and certainly 100 years ago, this wasn't the case. More than that, Asia is a place where Australians feel comfortable. Um, and this is particularly so in Indonesia because of Bali, I argue, I will argue. So the tourist boom of the second half of the 20th century has facilitated most Australian experience and knowledge of Asia, and this is particularly true of Indonesia. If by 1998, more Australians were travelling to Indonesia than to England, and that's always been seen as, you know, that strongest motherhood uh, kinship type. This year, one million Australians are expected to go to Bali. That's one million, one in every 23, going to Bali in one year alone. The extraordinary reach of this experience has affected Australian perceptions and attitudes uh, to not only Bali, but the nation of Indonesia, and moreover to the region of Asia as a whole. So I'll briefly look at this history of Australian travel to Bali, look at what it means and perhaps what some of those experiences were and how they've impacted on politics. So a pocket history. The island, the cliche that Bali was a tropical paradise gained currency from the 1930s. And this was largely fed on this exotic image of Balinese women, the Balinese belle, who famously didn't wear clothes on the upper part of their body fed a popular image of Bali as a paradise across the Western world. So that travel poster is quite typical of this. And, um, the Balinese bell as the symbol of paradise. By the 1950s, this had become so established that the road of the Palestine needs to the South Pacific, which is what we see in the middle when it was made into a film, was set on the beautiful island of Bali High. The rumours were there, and Australian travel writing, travel presses were following similar ideas, so it's definitely part of this cliche that this is paradise before the 1970s, but it took the 70s and the democratisation of tourism, particularly through the introduction of double jets and jet aircraft, before Bali began to attract Australians in any numbers. Jet aircraft in 1959 made travel to Asia faster and cheaper, and allowed those who didn't have the time or the money to go all the way to Europe to still have a chance at overseas travel. The jumbo jet, which you see here, from, uh, which flew in Australian skies from 1972, was particularly dramatic in its democratisation of tourism. And it's not a coincidence that it's around this time that our tourist class lost its previous meaning, which was, you know, a very superior standard suitable for an international clientele and came to know what we know that it means today, came to mean what we think it means today, which is more like cattle class. 
Sorry, the seven point seven in one sense allows more people to travel, but it can't be cost. Cafe was also lost. So the tourism industry took advantage of this. They had sort of this perfect destination image with now the means to get people there cheap. And they discounted, they developed new products and discounted holiday packages, um, which from this time began to lure growing numbers of middle class families. They went particularly to the hotels cropping around, cropping up around Sanor on the southeast coast of Bali. And so rather than sell seats, Travel agents began to requisition entire planes and charter planes. And rather than book individual rooms, they began to sort of take over entire hotels, which meant they could sell these packages for really very cheap prices. The economies of scale were really impressive, and so even after they'd taken their cut, if you have compared a holiday in Bali to a holiday just about anywhere else overseas, you've come up pretty well. This meant that as early as 1971, uh, papers such as the Sydney Morning Herald were enthusing that Bali was not only a multicolored landscape as seen in a dream, but it was also a matter of economics. In 1982, for example, a nine-day, seven-night package, including airfare from Melbourne, accommodation and some meals, cost $487, which represented just over a week of the average wage, uh, male wage, which at the time was spent. $338.80. So a holiday in Bali was indeed becoming an economic proposition, indeed roughly a week and a half to pay to go for my day for the night. It's important to note that this expansion of tourism not only happened in Australia because of Australian travel agents, but in Indonesia, largely through policies of the Suharto government. With World Bank backing and funding from Japanese war reparations, Suharto made tourism a key component of his modernization program. In 1969, he opened Mira Rai International Airport, which was built specifically to accommodate jumbo jets, which, considering that they hadn't started flying yet, was actually quite prescient. So a growing number of people, families, were going to Sanol, but other people, young people, who were doing the hippie trail to Europe at the time, also began to travel to Bali. They saw themselves as being alternative and a bit more special in many ways than the mass tourists. They were opposed to mass tourism, um, which they deemed to be inauthentic. But rather than sort of avoiding Bali as a whole, they just went to a different part of it. So rather than Sanoa, they were staying in Kuta, which developed this sort of alternative youth theme at the time. Yet their ideas weren't that far removed from the mainstream at all. The founders of the Lonely Planet guidebook, Tony Amor and Wheeler, portrayed the island very much like the Western Hammerstein version or the Sydney Morning Herald article that I read out um, the quote from before, as the perfect dream of a tropical island. And then Kruger, of these two major travel streams, mass tourism and the city trail, brought a great many Australians to the island. Again, another load of statistics, but they're easy to interpret. We don't have to do too much sort of math work here. What you see in this slide is very obviously a staggering rise in Australian visitors to Indonesia in just over 20 years. So that's 1965 to 1998. The sheer number of Australians was so big that they affected the island's tourist infrastructure and tourist culture. Before the 80s, if you went to Bali or if you were reading guidebooks about Bali, most of what you read about would be about the island culture, the people, the traditions, you know, that rich, colourful inland stuff. Guidebooks talked about the hinterlands, um, going into really great detail about the sort of temples, the dances, the paintings, and the myths, and directing travellers to rice paddies and cultural sites. Some guidebooks didn't even mention a single beach. And no one talked about dressing. But from the 70s, the tourist gaze shifted seaward. Although local culture continued to provide an interesting sidelight, the Balinese holiday was increasingly revolving around seaside leisure. And it's really important. It's one of the few places in the world where it's Australian beach culture that was the dominant tourist culture. You can see this in the way the infrastructure developed um, with an Australian beach pattern. The Balinese began to adopt Australian fashions more racist slang. Some did so in order to boost their tourism businesses, 
but others, particularly young Balinese, creating sort of really interesting hybrid modern culture. The Australian influence was particularly evident after sunset. Drinking and the bar scene were really important to the Balinese scene. Adrian Vickers has noted the beginning of what he calls a school physical youth scene around Kuda from the 1970s. And by the 1980s, this had very clearly developed into an Australian scene. It had an Australian accent. With AFL and NRL games, organised pop calls, and Vegemite eating contests firmly established in the Kuda bar scene. As the 1990s through Zone the Planet Guide noted, lo local bars had made a big pitch for the Aussie drinkers. Pods acquired names such as the Bali Aussie, which is the one that you see here. Another popular club, the Koala Blue, was described in Zone the Planet as a rather like an Australian barnyard club. Another guidebook assured readers that they wouldn't be lonely if they went to the Sari Club because it was always overflowing with Australian visitors. The shift, I mean, this was becoming so dramatic and so noticeable that even mainstream press was starting to pay attention. It's not just the guidebook. The Sunday Age ran a special report on, you know, Bali and Australian Bali in 1998. And they described Kuna as having an Aussie heartland in which Victoria Vita is everywhere and the streets that will speak their English with an Aussie accent. This blurred cultural space of Bali, at once Indonesian and Balinese, a Hindu island in a Muslim nation and increasingly dominated by tourists, and particularly Australians, led some to Australian tourists to assume that local mores were flexible and all kinds of behaviour would be accommodated. As early as 1977, Lonely Planet Southeast Asia on a shoestring claimed that in Kuda, even the most outrageous behaviour is tolerated, even found amusing. Another guidebook published that year, the Indonesia Handbook, reported that Kuda was becoming a real thin alley, overflowing with wine within a goat. Interestingly, it wasn't just women either. By the 70s, the Indonesia Do It Yourself guide reported that hundreds of visiting Australian single girls lived with Balinese boys, and they advised all flowers and the curious to head to Bali to take advantage of this unique thing. Uh, which flourished quietly. I mean, it was a really big part of the Balinese um, tourist industry. It was very quiet until the um, a really controversial documentary in 2010 called Cowboys in Paradise. So the myth is a bid on the gigolo industry in Bali, of course, quite the stir in Indonesia. So this model of sun, surf, and spinner tourism was again catered for by the tourism industry. Qantas and Garuda Indonesia both developed high package deals which specifically targeted 18 to 30 year olds from the late 1980s. And over the next 20 years, this became the norm. This is no surprise. We know this now from the schoolies and the schoolies phenomenon. But even back in 1998, uh, a journalist interviewed a few tourists and Gaza, a young Australian on holidays, sorry, Gaza, a young Australian on holidays from Port Hedland explains, this is Bali, my friend. Make a fuck with it yourself. Doesn't matter. What goes away, stays away. Guidebooks by this time were insisting that to get in taste of what the real Bali is, you have to abandon the beaches. But the desperation in their tone indicates that this wasn't actually happening. Rather than travelling to see the exotic difference of Balinese culture, many Australians were just going there to do what they'd be doing back home. Go out, go to the beach, get drunk. On, on holidays. On the beach, this is what many Australians are doing in their everyday lives. So, whereas Asia was once seen as a distant, distant far east, this is really important. Bali was now beginning to seem like home, a bit of the pleasure periphery getting in. In ancient nations, historians David Wolf has shown us that while the attributes Australians ascribe to Asia have changed over the past century, they always, Asia and Asians, have always been considered fundamentally other, very different. By the early 90s, the experience of Bali had actually begun to shift it in some ways. The sheer number of Australians and the familiar atmosphere around Twitter seemed to set Australians at ease and encourage casual references to Bali as Australia's favourite playground, a home away from home, or even another state of Australia, to leave more quotes. 
His mental annexation saw some Australians come to claim that Bali wasn't actually very Asian at all, and so challenged those differences between what was Asian and what was Australian. When he visited Bali back in 1939, popular writer Frank Poole had described the Balinese as overwhelmingly other. He called them pagan primitives who mechanically embraced the ecstasies of their jungle rituals. Thirty years later, in the late 60s, another writer, Ronald Mackay, wrote that the Balinese were, quote, so profoundly Asian that they could be perceived but were beyond the perimeter of understanding. This sense of Asianness, of otherness, all but disappeared with the rise of Australian accent and mass tourism. In his 1973 travelogue, Colin Simpson claims that although Indonesia is thought of as being part of Southeast Asia, much of it actually lies closer to Australia than it does to continental Asia. Not only was it close, but according to Simpson, it also shared a time zone and a climatic zone in northern Australia. And so he began to profile tourists who were visiting Bali, visiting Indonesia, just because it was easier or cheaper than getting to, their, uh, to Bali than to surfers or to the Gulf Coast. And he was particularly focused on people from WA and surf travellers. This became, of course, even more common over the next 40 years again. By 1998, the Australian consul in Bali, George Fraser, was matter of factly stating that Bali was just the new Gold Coast holiday. So tourism in this context, perhaps, was affecting the ways in which Australians were also thinking not only about Asia and what was Asian, but also about Australia. Travel is important that in that it shapes political subjectivity. It probes people, as I was suggesting, into thinking about their place in the world, both literally and geopolitically. Some Australians reflected on this nearness, on this proximity, the fact that Australia was now increasingly close to the region after going to Bali. If there was one truism of Australian nationhood, it was that it was tyrannised by distance. The land down under was far from anywhere. So it could take travellers by surprise to find that, to find themselves in Bali, only five or six hours after leaving Sydney or Melbourne, or only a couple of hours after leaving Perth. This wasn't just a matter of convenience, it could force a fundamental rethinking of Australia's geographical and political place in the world. The introduction of commercial air travel in the 40s and 50s had encouraged profound shifts in the way Australians thought of their region. As Frank Quinn wrote, Australians should recognise that thanks to air travel, the Far East has now become the near north. Language like Queen's, which emphasised proximity by referring to the near north, became more common as increasing numbers set up to the region and encouraged this broader reappraisal of Australia's relationship with Asia. So rather than people separated by vast distances, you know, geographic distances, cultural distances, racial distance, all of these things which had previously been accentuated, Australians were now talking about the near north and the neighbourhood. So proximity, it was so easy to get to that um, it was forcing people to think about the regionalism and which region Australia actually fit into. It's telling that uh, Asia was being referred to as Australia's neighbourhood, and Indonesia in particular became seen as Australia's nearest neighbour. Um, in a way, and this is still of course a cliche, almost every single press interview with a politician you're going to get um, comes up talking about Indonesia as Australia's nearest neighbour. Which of course it may not be. Papua New Guinea probably has a better geographical claim and historical claim. So individual travellers began to reflect on their nation's place in the world during holiday to Bali, and this was echoed in political culture. By the 1980s, policies of engagement with Asia had been replaced by references to enmeshment and even integration. So we've seen similar tracks being followed by politics and also by popular ideas. Not all travellers and not all Australians thought that this was a good thing. This idea, this replacing of Australia in the new, this new region, the Asia Pacific region, rather than as a distant outpost of Europe, caused a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern. Some of it was against this idea of Australia being a part of Asia, and there was always a uh, constituency of Australians who will argue that no, it's not and it never will be. But others worried about whether Australia had 
skills or whether Australia had the cachet to actually become accepted in the region. So it was a two way of anxiety. There was cultural cringe as well as cultural some sense of arrogance. The early 1990s saw the release of two tourist novels, uh, two major Australian tourist novels, Ines Baranese, The Edge of Bali, and Jerry Lee, Topo Man. Tellingly, both are set in Bali, and both charted the horrified reactions of sort of more sensitive travellers as they're faced with the hordes of drunk, sunburnt, fat Australian tourists on the beach. The protagonist of the lead novel, Matt, gazes on the scene before him and declares that what was happening here to the Balinese was terrible. As a result of contact with Australians, he says, one of the world's most refined and spiritual cultures has been corrupted. Bali's nightclubs and pubs were most likely to provoke national naval gazing by a self-declared elite. Actress Lisa McKeon, who was at the time at the height of her fame, uh, for example, was interviewed in 1998 and she admitted to visiting the Sari Club, but she said that she was a little bit embarrassed as she was doing so. She said, I felt a bit embarrassed sometimes standing near Australians. Their behaviour was a bit out of control. This belief that Australians needed to portray a more diplomatic image, a more sort of acceptable image to the world, is it going to be accepted as part of the Asia Pacific region? sort of portrays broader political ideas and political anxieties about Australia's place in the world and capacity to engage with the region, which we still hear in this idea that Australians need more Asia literacy and perhaps something of a spur behind this latest investment in Indonesian studies. So such anxieties notwithstanding, the ease with which many Australians made themselves at home on Bali's beaches and in nightclubs represented obviously a broad shift. Australia's proximity to Asia had long been a cause for anxiety rather than celebration. And now, in this light, the fact that Australians in Bali were feeling comfortable rather than afraid as a result of contact with the region is significant. And it's also important because remember that wide reach. This is experienced firsthand by millions of people finding their enjoying rather than fear in Asia. This is important itself. But really, the major impact of this long period of um, comfort in Bali really came to have political significance after the Bali bombing of 2002. So late on the night of 12th October 2002, terrorists struck at the heart of Australian Kuda, at the Sari Club in Haifa, and killed 202 people, of whom 88 were Australians. Speaking at the Australian consulate in Denpasar a week after the attack, Prime Minister John Howard summed up what a lot of people were thinking. The bombings had shocked our nation to the core, he said. The shock was so great because of the belief that the attack had been targeted at Australians, or even that this was an attack on Australia itself. And we see this in the front pages, so um, of many front pages, and almost all newspapers at some, um, in some of their articles, Refer to Bali either as Australia's home, our doorstep, or our back door. These were bombs that were, you know, bringing home terrorism. The Australians portray Bali as an exotic little northern state of Australia, and the Gold Coast Bulletin went even further, claiming that Bali was in fact the nation's symbolic heart. I can't really emphasize just how big that is, for any people to say that Bali is Australia's symbolic heart. So this provides an insight, I'd argue, into the discourse-making power of travel and tourism. In the shock following the Bali bombing, the tourist image of Bali, as a home away from home, took on new resonance, providing an emotive undercurrent to reports of the terrorist attack. Years of comfortable holiday-making had allowed casual citizens, which referred to Bali as part of Australia, and this in turn supported the interpretation that terrorist attacks had been targeted at Australia and not at Indonesia, which of course they were. This came despite early statements by those involved in the attack, which suggested that they had chosen Bali because they saw it as a symbol of degradation of Indonesia and Muslim mores, and perhaps as a space made to find Americans, rather than as a place to target Australians. So early indications were that Australians weren't actually 
special target, and this wasn't directed at, you know, terrorist extracting homes and in Australia. Nonetheless, um, the Australian foreign editor Greg Sheridan was certainly not alone when he reported that there can be little doubt that Australians were specifically targeted. Media academics uh, who sort of analysed the coverage in the years since have found that a great majority, as much as 95% in one count, of the soft coverage focused on Australians and that the tone of reporting was overwhelmingly sentimental, as this was about home neighbourhoods being attacked ourselves. Politicians on both sides also borrowed from these tourism images. Liberal Bruce Baird, for example, claimed that this was, quote, the first time we have seen such a terrorist attack directly on the people of Australia, and that this represented, again, quote, the loss of innocence for Australia. This idea of the loss of innocence was really common at the time. Um, leader of the opposition, so this was the Labour opposition time, and Crane at the time was using similar words as a many, many journalists. Such views had distinct political impacts. The sense that the bombings had struck home and had taken away Australia's innocence bolstered support for the US led war on terror. In the words of Labour MP Sid Sidebottom, the fact that terrorism has struck on our doorstep means that we, don't, we do not have the option to be neutral. This rhetoric that this was a direct attack on Australia for Australia to retaliate are uh, infused government and public service where many of the uh, functional policy decisions were made. The Australian Federal Police referred to the Bali bombings as Australian September 11, and not the nation. In an official report, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade claimed that the attack brought home to Australia the global reach of terrorism. CSAT also released a paper called Transnational Terrorism and Threat to Australia, which claimed that the Bali bombings had shown conclusively that terrorists were targeting, targeting Australia because, quote, we stand in the way of their ultimate goal to establish an Islamic super state. A number of political scientists have noted that this language, which linked terrorism to attacks on Australia, supported a combative response. As MP Damien Hale was to say during a commemoration ceremony for years later, because of the Bali bombing, no longer do Australians feel that terrorism is someone else's problem. No longer do we feel that these events happen somewhere else in the world. The view that the attack on Bali was in fact an attack on Australia, a discourse at least partly generated by those decades of tourism experiences I was talking about before, helped bolster a conservative foreign policy response that involved police and military to decide tourism to close. Things that came under sustained criticism in the wake of the bombing, with headlines demanding why didn't they tell us what they know, for example. CFAT reacted strongly, dramatically wrapping up a system of travel advisory who are probably familiar or very familiar with the smart travel system, especially those of us that can get approval traveling there for work. Right after the Bali bombing, CFAT uh, ramped up the new travel advisory, so it began to post you know, dramatic numbers of travel advisories, revising them every few months, sometimes weeks, sometimes daily, and publicizing them. So at one point in around 2003, 2004, you couldn't really open a newspaper, listen to the radio, definitely not travel without being made aware at some level of smart traveler. It had a $9.7 million publicity campaign. So with ads on television, on radio, print media, touchscreen kiosk at airports, um, and billboards, all of which told you to check CFAP website. And with the launch of a Charter for Safe Travel, which was a partnership program between DFAT and the tourism industry, you literally couldn't book a flight overseas to your travel agent without being told the travel advisory as you, as you may be looking. These travel advisories not only politicised this idea of you know, where is safe in the world and where is not safe, it created this sort of regional perspective. So it regionalised this idea of terrorist threat and the lack of safety across all of Southeast Asia. Within days of the first blast, CFAT had amended travel advice not only to Indonesia, but also to Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Singapore. On 25th October 2002, Foreign Minister Alexander Downer warned Australians that the Thai holiday resort of Phuket was a potential target, and he advised Australians to actually defer non essential travel, so he said to cancel the holidays even though no credible threat had actually been identified. 
Curry in the morning was a food post of for pretty much every Southeast Asian destination, including nations with little or no previous known terrorist activity. This fed into a broader trend of government and media representing Australia as being surrounded by an arc of instability. The nearness of Asia, which had begun to be rendered safe through tourism discourses, was once again acquiring a threatening undertone. The smart travel system is really interesting and the politics around it are really interesting. I won't really go into much detail in them today. Um, but it provides a really interesting case study of how governments try but often fail to manage uh, public flows overseas. And the fact that public actually can direct government policy here. So popular responses to the bombing. This was the government response, but how did the people respond? We can see this to some extent in the fluctuating numbers of Australians visiting Bali. The bombings of 2002 and 2005, along with SARS and bird flu epidemics, the Asian tsunami of 2004, and the negative reporting surrounding Chappelle Corby's arrest and incarceration around the same time, combined to create a sense of crisis in the region. And again, I'm talking about Chappelle Corby, if you think I'm interested in the question. Um, these, these combined to create this real sense of crisis. Australians were no longer safe in Indonesia. The number of Australians choosing of Indonesia as their primary destination fell by more than a third from 2001 to 2003, bringing the figure back to 1992 level um, and towards increasing tourist numbers. This same thing happened after the second attack in 2005, numbers again took a dive, and smart travel advisories again began to sound particularly shrill after the second bombing. Yet despite the anxiety, despite the smart traveller um, advisories, and despite these sort of extremely of crises, the long-term pattern of Australians becoming increasingly comfortable and familiar with their region was strong enough to overcome these shocks. Tourism numbers to Bali returned to normal since 2007 and have been seen record highs since. This is since 1976 to 2011. You can see that the biggest jump has actually been since 2007. It's almost a vertical climb. We're talking from 300, uh, sorry, from 200,000 in 2007 to almost 900,000 in 2011. That's pretty much unprecedented. Just about anywhere in the world, I would see. Tourism numbers, uh, last year almost 900,000 Australians, that's approximately 1 in 25 visited Bali. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, approximately a million of them over here. As a point of comparison, the highest record before the bombing had been less than 750,000. So the apparent paradox by which more Australians travel to Bali after a serious crisis than before is a result of several factors. How do we explain this? Firstly, there was a difficulty to find this idea that we can't let the terrorists win by changing stuff travel patterns or cancelling holidays. Second, which we don't know how influential that was, but it was there. It was an idea that people said when they were asked to explain their holidays. Secondly, a sense of shared suffering inspired some Australians to return to Bali um, in order to help the economy. So in the words of one returning tourist, one returning tourist, the Balinese need us. And many Australians were well, were well inclined to repay years of holiday pleasures by coming back buying a few extra t-shirts, having a couple of extra massages, because they began to sort of pay for some sort of an aid or humanitarian assistance to the depressed tourism economy. Thirdly, and most importantly, people were going back because it was becoming cheaper and cheaper. The tourism industry was responding to both bombings with aggressive discounting strategies, and holidays in Bali became cheaper than ever. In June 2005, Flight Centre was offering a 10 night package, including airfares from Sydney, accommodation, a tour, two massages, and some meals for $895. And the short lived airline Air Pacific International had a six night package for $659, including flight. The discounting was even more dramatic and more aggressive after the second volume of 2005. So in 2006, if you book through Jet Set, you get a four-night family package, airfare for one adult and two children, transfers, all the kids' meals for the entire family away, entry to the water bomb park and nine tours, 
for $949, which was less than the average weekly income of $1,058. Which means that after the period of crisis, it's actually probably cheaper to take a holiday in Bali than to stay home. And it was definitely cheaper than to go away anywhere else. Which means that Australians were most likely returning to Bali for the same reasons that had taken them there before. Because it was convenient and because it was cheap and because they felt comfortable in what had become their second home. Again, it might seem banal on the surface, but the speed of the return to pre bombing habits revealed that the stream of crises at Bali hit between 2002 and 2005 didn't replace those longer term <coughs> infections as developed through travel issues and stream experiences. This is another way of showing the same thing, but perhaps it's even more drama. By the end of the 20th century, tourism had become the dominant mode of Australian interaction with Asia. I think there is, there's very little that can be argued against that. Millions of holiday experiences had encouraged a widespread sense of personal and emotional connection to the region and influenced popular perceptions of Asia and Asians. In this light, the argument goes, tourism becomes a form of people's diplomacy, providing the base in which governments can build. Which is, of course, not to say, and I wouldn't suggest it at all, that more tourism equals more understanding. There's a range of experiences that Australians have in Indonesia. Some of them are sort of net positive, and some of them could be cast as perhaps more questionable. I've already noted that FBY thinks that the Australian Indonesia relationship is hampered by misperception. Remember, he wants Australians to think of Indonesia as being more than a beach on play playground with coconut trees, is a quote. The Indonesia Institute's Ross Taylor also in, in the last week when commenting on why we need this Indonesian study set, why we need to improve perceptions, his comment was uh, Australians think of Indonesia they think negative things because of Bali gone wrong and Muslim. So there's another side to the story though, in which the positive outcomes of people to people contact are even less clear. The fact that so much Australian knowledge of Asia, and particularly Indonesia, is produced through travel and tourism has another effect in that it seems to reconfirm out of date and arguably neo colonial views about the relations between Australia and Asia. The economic inequalities inherent in first world travel to the third world can enforce a profound distance between tourists and locals. Poverty matters. And Australian attitudes towards Asia are affected by the belief that we are rich, they are poor. We're developed, they're backward. Attitudes which are reinforced by the context of travel and tourism, in which, of course, almost by definition, tourists have surplus money. They do nothing, they don't work, they just buy. And locals provide services, so they're servants or even supplicants. This has a largely unexplored and uh, unquantified effect on Indonesian perceptions of Australia. In the case of Australian perceptions of Asia, however, people's diplomacy has had profound implications. In the early 20th century, among the most common adjectives Australians used about Asians was inscrutable. Asians were seen as entirely different creatures. They behaved differently, they thought differently, and you simply couldn't tell what was going through their minds. As a result, many jumped to conclusions. Fears of invasion, either direct or through stopping migration, were rife. In fiction, the Asian characters tended towards the three months shoe type, so you know, evil geniuses planning to take over the world. Nowadays, you'd be really hard to to find that. Rather than inscrutable, among the most common words used to describe Balinese is a tourist cliche, there are particular people. While a stereotype is still a stereotype, content does matter when it comes to foreign affairs. And when it comes to shaping perceptions, pleasure matters here as well as poverty and both of the to Australian relations with Asia. So in this paper, I'm putting forward a model in which travel shapes political subjectivity, and I'm arguing that this is an increasingly important frame through which to look at international history as a whole in this period of um, hypermobility and globalization. Political subjectivity shape attitudes and perceptions of the other, and these in turn help constitute foreign affairs, which is obviously very important if we are talking about public history, which is of course today's topic. Saturday marks the 11th anniversary of the first Bali bombings of the 12th October 2002. 
If this year is like every other year since that terrible event, there'll be a spike of interest in the bombing in Bali, in Indonesia, and in Australian relations with Indonesia around the anniversary. Every year, the media focuses on Australia and Bali, and I'm sort of wheeled out of academic irrelevance and the ivory tower is sort of thrust in on unsafe spotlights, but a few media um, people seem to get interested. So last year on the 10th anniversary, I had interviews with really quite almost unexpected sorts of people like Ethan Stubbs, um, which got in touch to talk about Bali and talk about Indonesia and politics. And I am nowhere near the top of most journalists' list. You know, they voted as strategic policy expert rather than the cultural historian. But this is an interesting angle to my work I've been told by media types. The public like to hear about themselves and how they affect international. Politics. There's a sort of narcissism which makes this an interesting topic for Australians. The public likes to hear about themselves, and this is important in terms of public history. This helps history and international relations become something that is discussed amongst you know, ordinary people. And it can also be useful for contemporary development. Tourist contacts have created a reservoir of sentiment in the world. Again, think back to perhaps your own travel experiences. You've met people overseas, you've made some friends, you now have a personal connection to that place. I know when the Bali bombings happened, I had been to Bali myself before. And so you reflect through the prism of your own memory. The number of those personal contacts, the connections to Bali, Indonesia, and Asia, are an important avenue for contemporary development and contemporary politics. A truly public history, including travel and tourism, helps involve ordinary Australians in the conduct of their nation's foreign policy. The wider understanding of Asia, as well as a sense of personal connection, can be leveraged in contemporary attempts to promote Asian literacy and engagement with the region ahead of the Asian century. Finally, I'd argue that this case study also addresses the question of public history from another angle, in that it brings the public in as an agent of history. And this is my concluding point, and really the the point I'd like to leave you with. International history, again, I tend to operate on the level of elite. We were talking before about politicians and diplomats. But the, in most history, foreign relations are conducted through formal negotiations, sovereign representatives um, <coughs> of nations, sorry, office representatives of sovereign nations, taking place through diplomatic cables. These aren't necessarily inclusive histories. We're told international relations occurred at a place that we can't relate to. This model obviously fails to convince in an age marked by certain foundations on which foreign affairs are built. And working towards a public history of international relations, an international uh, history that recognises ordinary people as agents of history, can do so by following the many millions of Australians who have been violated. Very much, Yoshi. That was uh, what was a great, great paper of that. Thank you for such a sort of interesting point. I wonder whether uh, seeing as you've got so many people like the students here, as well as other um, unsuspecting members of the public, anyone has any questions while we have Yoshi and she's got a bit more time to ask? Um, <laughs> Um, sure. So the it's 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 really a theoretical term for a really simple basic concept of what people think about themselves, the world, and their place in the world. So you know how we imagine who we are in the national and international context is political. Um, in that it's those sorts of habits of mind. You know, it's what Australia is. Is it an Anglo-Saxon nation? Is it an Asian nation? Who is Australian? What does it mean to be Australian? Those sort of habits of mind, the, the really easy ideas which you sort of answer without even having to think about, are a political subjectivity on an individual level. So individual ideas about the world, the subjectivity that form sort of on a broader societal scale, um, popular attitudes. I thought that was something from a great paper, and I really love that sort of perspective of the tourism industry, because it really makes the world history. 
today. I just wanted to ask you about um, what kind of perspectives you get from coming the other way. So the ways in which Indonesia has framed Australia in a popular way. It's an interesting question and one that I'm probably not qualified to answer. <laughs> but I'm going to give a sort of what I do know and the system or the fact that my expertise is in the nation of Asia, uh, Australia the other way around. The one point that is very clear is that it's not based on this same like, same topic. So it's not indigenous experiences of Australia that form popular images. So Lowy Institute does a lot of polling in Indonesia of Indonesian attitudes towards Australia. And often what is seen um, there are media images and sort of broader rumors rather than personal experience. So perhaps the traditional model, the site, you know, the orientalist model of what constitutes knowledge about foreign places, which is, you know, through media, through literature, through art, um, and through politics. Lowy has tracked, they are, they're arguing that it's become increasingly positive, so they think that indigenous sentiment has warmed considerably in the last few years, and they're not necessarily able to explain that. Um, and so I would hesitate to as well. But over a long period of time, Australian um, perceptions in Indonesia as a nation have sort of gone through peak and trough. There have been some peak moments. With Bali, there is a different point to be made. There's a different case study. And I tried to do this research a couple of years back when I, was, I had fellowships in, in Bali in Indonesia. And I spent a really long time going around, you know, um, government agents to government tourism bodies to tourism promotions, travel agents, pretty much everyone who's involved with tourism, as well as, you know, ordinary people, asking what they thought of this, you know, what do you think about Australia? And got nothing except, you know, we love Australia. We love the positive, we love that. Um, there is this sort of wellspring of goodwill from Australians that they want to come visit us, they're our guests, it's hospitable, which obviously is very polite and really lovely, but not necessarily convincing. So I came away with a lot of very pleasant, highly diplomatic quotes, but a real sense that we weren't scratching the surface because there is in Bali quite a lot of tension surrounding tourism, in particular the numbers that they've gone up since the Bali model is really pushing infrastructure. Um, on the islands, and there are increasing resentments against tourists in general, and perhaps Australia in particular. Um, a scholar with whom I was working in Indonesia, in Anatol Sutra, has written this sort of, he wrote a piece um, last year in which he was accessing Balinese literature in Balinese language, which again is the minority language of Indonesia, so it's not read by people outside outside the island, let alone in Australia. And he was reading against the grain of a few novels and movies since the 70s, which were portraying Australians as the dominant tourist character. And a lot of those negative traits were being um, both were being sort of explored through those characters. So in one um, book in particular, there was an Australian tourist who fell in love with a local. that this was an illegitimate thing for the Indonesian officials to be doing. I um, remember also some of the shock jobs at the time were saying really kind of disturbingly racist stuff about the judges who were trying to come for these, saying that they, you know, they didn't even speak English, so what right did they have to try an Australian? Um, and, try, and asking questions about the legitimacy of the Indonesian judicial system. So there was Definitely that is an element of sort of quality, um, sort of again, media fiasco. In terms of tourism, I think it's really, it's a long term idea. You know, playing, we're talking about attitudes in general is, of course, problematic in the first place. Talking about them over really long term, you do start to get into some pretty abstract ideas. Basically, the argument for that you neo know, colonial line is that personal experience is, a, is so much experience is through that context where Australians are rich and able to serve Australians. 
that helps you know reinforce ideas which had already been there from the colonial period. And the tourism industry is quite interesting. It's interesting. He follows it the way that through where they were going, how they were being treated, and how they were acting. It was a direct line from the colonial period through post-colonialism. So the same hotels were opening up, you know, to in post-colonial Indonesia as had been operating in colonial Zapic Indies. And they had the same stuff, the same service, and the same sort of obsequiousness about who was uh, treated as a guest and who was allowed in on the ground at some point. So if you sort of look back and you can trace that nothing changed during that period and sort of the tourism industry took that as a model of how things work in Asia, because obviously the cost of labour is much lower so you can have servants in a way that you don't in Australia. The suggestion is, and I can't do more than suggest, you know, I mean, can't really progress this too much because as I say it's quite long term and it's quite generalised, but the suggestion is that that helps create and sort of consolidate previous ideas which may not be politically low in our current. Um, I have a uh, comment to my question. Uh, listen to you talk about uh, Indonesia and the world, but not just uh, Bali. I think in many different times, uh, and as a general issue, when you hear about, worried about, you know, uh, Indonesia, currently it's appropriate. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I know it's not the, the focus of your talk, but uh, listening to it, it's been really interesting to think about. The, the two way flows of people to Indonesia um, and the masses of people going, and the way that we almost have a sense of entitlement about going to our New York, yet we have this dystopia of, of anyone daring to, to come to us. And I, I personally, I mean, I'm not you know, academic, but I, I think that's quite interesting to contemplate that. And I do have a question about do you think this? Both generalizing here, this is both phobia, it's kind of taking over as the image of Indonesia more generally, not specifically Bali, as, as the new prism through which we associate with Indonesia and Asia more broadly. Thank you, that's a really good question and a really well hit point because it has become really the major issue in politics. So, you know, Recent sort of um, trips to Indonesia have really been made through the um, context of those people. But the thing is, it's really new for that to be what Australians associate with Indonesia. Previously, there's been a lot of negative coverage in Indonesia um, over the past, you know, 40, 50 years. A lot of negative imagery, the dark, as sort of the dark undercurrent of Southeast Asia and having this menacing idea. But it hadn't ever been about refugee people. It hadn't been about asylum seekers. It had been constantly about some sort of idea of being invaded. This is our biggest threat militarily. Um, and during the sort of Sukarno period, as a potentially left wing and being part of potentially rogue um, nation that was good, that could do these things if they were unpredictable. I'm not sure whether this is just a blip. This is just a, a, a case of domestic politics taking over old images. So the old anxiety about you know, Asian invasion and Asian migration being swamped by Asian people in Asian terms, being recast onto the new um, sort of political hot topic of the moment. I'm not sure whether that's the short term or whether it will continue, but it definitely keeps up those older anxieties. It's sort of enveloped and swallowed the what previous negative views about Indonesia and just recast them in this new light. It, it is an interesting place to go and need to be though, considering that most of the people who actually come to Australia aren't interested in this though. This isn't an issue to do with Indonesia really at all. But the um, yeah, exactly. The focus is on Indonesia. When you hear about both people now, the conversation has turned to being about Indonesia rather than about uh, the place from which the um, is um, coming. Um, I just thought, I uh, wonder if I could follow on from that a bit. Uh, so, speaking more about both people and um, 
you mentioned like, um, asking Indonesians themselves about their attitudes towards Australian tourists, you felt like um, there was like a hidden resentment that you couldn't quite put your finger on. And um, with regards to the boat people, we've heard the Indonesians um, more explicitly um, reject our idea or the other government's ideas about um, asylum seeker policy. So I was wondering if you thought there was any underlying, um, not hatred of Australia, but like resentment of Australia that you think is palpable and ready to like explode the bilateral relationship, maybe yeah. in less dramatic terms. Yeah, I wouldn't use the kind of explode, it's kind of loaded term in this um, yeah, context. But yes, there are definitely are uh, resentments against Australian what's perceived what's seen as an Australian arrogance in terms of incursions on Indonesian sovereignty, which goes all the way back to the West uh, New Guinea debate, especially around nineteen sixty two. So, you know, the island of Pocket of New Guinea, um, the West Side, which had previously been a Dutch colony part of the Dutch East Indies, had been left up for grabs until the later period. And Australia, which initially had supported Indonesian independence, in the end ended up really strongly going against Indonesia taking West New Guinea. And that has been a sore point ever since. So even now, I mean, contemporaneous to the asylum seeker discussions, that's what Australia talks about, but Compass and some other um, behalf of Indonesia, uh, but some other Indonesian um, English language and also behalf of press really are talking about the West New Guinea and you're in dire now. And that has an issue. So Australia at the moment is still seen as supporting um, the independence of Iran Jaya. So the flotilla of activists which had left Australia recently to sort of campaign against that was being painted as representing Australian government policy and also Australian popular policy. So yes, I think that there are, I mean, there's always tensions between, there's always some negative conflict with Indonesia which can be identified as almost any international relationship when it comes to perception. But there is definitely, you know, a nerve. If Australia has a nerve, has this anxiety about, you know, Asian Indonesians coming to Australia perhaps in an unauthorised way, then a similar nerve on the Indonesian side would be that Australia secretly wants to take a part of Indonesia or to somehow destabilise, you know, to the core of the nation. Would be our last question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the, um, the underlying reason for the problem problem is quite a lot of for uh, Australians, uh, but uh, I think there's enough others to understand that it's probably because of just the, the, the liberalization and the tensions you mentioned um, between the Asian culture in Indonesia. I wonder if that has led to uh, the site of tourists going to Australia back to Indonesia. I wonder if that has led to uh, a shift in terms of the behaviors or a more uh, responsible tourism, long tourism. 